Hey everyone and welcome to Med Insights. Today we will talk about a massive topic worldwide in the latest years, gastroesophageal reflux disease. It's not like if you've heard about heartburn you automatically know all about GERD, right? Well, it's not the case here. First things first, we will start at the very beginning. GERD stands for gastroesophageal reflux disease. At its core, it's when stomach contents, primarily stomach acid and sometimes bile, consistently reflux back up into your esophagus. This backward flow of acid happens frequently, typically two or more times a week, and it leads to potential damage to the esophageal lining. The main problem lies with the lower esophageal sphincter, or LES. This muscular ring is the junction between the esophagus and stomach. Normally, the LES acts as a one-way valve. It opens when you swallow to let food into the stomach, then quickly and tightly closes to keep stomach contents in. Therefore, in the presence of a causing factor, LES works inefficiently. So the gastric acid comes back to the esophagus and can irritate, inflame, and eventually damage the esophageal tissue. GERD has a variety of symptoms. They're often categorized as typical or esophageal and atypical extraesophageal. The first typical symptom is heartburn, which is the hallmark symptom. It is particularly worse after heavy meals, when lying down, or during bedtime hours. Another typical symptom is regurgitation, which is the effortless return of sour or bitter stomach acid into the throat or mouth. Chest pain is another clinical manifestation the patient can experience, which is typically mild to moderate and it is highly responsive to PPI administration. We must always differentiate the pain caused by a gastroesophageal reflux and the chest pain from other pathologies like myocardial infarction. The pain from GERD almost certainly will cease upon proton pump inhibitor administration. The atypical or extraesophageal manifestations are symptoms developed near the esophagus and they are still caused by reflux. One such symptom is dysphagia, or in other words, difficulty swallowing. Essentially, dysphagia occurs when a complication of the acid reflux, called esophageal stricture, narrows the food pathway so the food gets stuck into the esophagus. Sometimes dysphagia can be accompanied by other symptom called odynophagia, a symptom that is also defined as painful swallowing. This clinical manifestation is a consequence of the acid reflux that inflames the inferior part of the pharynx. Other times, the patient may experience a persistent and unexplained cough. This happens especially during nighttime because the acid affects the airways. If the acid vapor irritates the vocal cords, this can lead to a raspy voice, particularly worse in the morning. This symptom is also known as hoarseness. Other GERD manifestations can be a new onset or a worsening of asthma symptoms, such as wheezing and shortness of breath. GERD is caused by a variety of risk factors often found in combination. A major contributor is hiatal hernia. A hiatal hernia occurs when a portion of the stomach pushes through the diaphragm. This disrupts the normal anatomy, compromising the effective barrier against gastric reflux. It is very common, especially in elderly patients with other comorbidities. Normally, after a reflux episode, the esophagus has waves of muscle contractions called peristalsis that quickly push the acid back down. In some patients, these esophageal muscle contractions are weak or uncoordinated, meaning acid stays in the esophagus longer, causing more damage. This process is called impaired esophageal clearance. Anything that pushes up on the stomach can overwhelm the gastroesophageal sphincter. This mechanism is known as increased intra-abdominal pressure. It includes several common instances like obesity, this is a huge risk factor. Excess abdominal fat significantly increases intra-abdominal pressure, pushing contents upward. Pregnancy, with great uterus, comes with great intra-abdominal pressure. Specific foods and habits such as smoking, drinking alcohol, lying in bed immediately after eating, very spicy foods, or even some medications can exacerbate GERD symptoms. Ignoring persistent GERD or failing to manage it effectively can lead to significant and potentially severe complications. The first one is esophagitis, which basically is the inflammation of the esophagus. Secondly, we have esophageal stricture, which is a fibrous band that narrows the esophagus due to scar tissue formation. Lastly, there is Barrett's esophagus, a serious complication where the normal squamous cells of the lower esophagus are replaced by columnar cells, like those in the intestine, as a protective response to chronic acid exposure. The risk here is the associated chances to developing esophageal cancer. Diagnosing GERD involves a step-by-step -step approach, moving from simple interventions to more invasive tests. For patients with typical GERD symptoms, heartburn regurgitation, and no alarm symptoms, the initial approach is often a presumptive diagnosis based on symptoms. 
A proton pump inhibitor trial is recommended starting with a course of a PPI for four to eight weeks. If alarm symptoms are present or the patient is not responsive to treatment, further investigation is necessary. An upper endoscopy is a key examination for determining gastroesophageal reflux. It allows us to benefit from a direct visualization of the esophagus, stomach, and duodenum. In this way, we can see any signs of esophagitis such as inflammation, erosions, ulcers, strictures, or hiatal hernia, and we can take multiple biopsies if something is not normal. Using upper endoscopy, we can easily grade the severity of esophagitis using the Los Angeles classification of the esophagitis. The most frequent is the grade A esophagitis, and the most predisposed to complications is grade D esophagitis. The good news is that GERD is highly treatable. The goal is symptom relief, healing of esophageal damage, preventing complications, and improving quality of life. Current strategies indicate that the first step is to change some personal habits and doings. Dietary modifications such as weight loss, elevating the head of the bed, changing eating habits, avoiding large meals and eating within two to three hours of bedtime can make a high difference in the quality of life. Smoking and alcohol cessation and avoiding personal trigger foods can be highly beneficial and can provide long-term symptom relief. We usually combine all of these changes with medications so we can obtain the most effective therapeutic response. The most powerful acid suppressors are the proton pump inhibitors like esomeprazole, pantoprazole, or omeprazole. They act by blocking the proton pumps in stomach cells responsible for acid secretion. An alternative to proton pump inhibitors are the H2 receptor blockers like famotidine. These drugs will reduce acid production by blocking histamine receptors on stomach cells. In mild forms of gastroesophageal reflux, we can even consider antiacids, especially for infrequent, occasionally heartburn or regurgitation. Surgery is another therapeutic option, especially when we know the exact underlying cause. For instance, to treat larger hiatal hernia, Nissen funduplication is the most common surgical procedure. The upper part of the stomach, called fundus, is wrapped around the lower esophagus to reinforce the LES. It is very important how the procedure is made because if the upper part of the stomach is too tight, it can cause dysphagia, so the patient cannot ingest food anymore. Otherwise, if it is too loose, the procedure has no purpose and the patient will experience the same starting symptoms. Here is where we are wrapping things up. I hope you find this video useful and I hope it helped you understand better this GERD situation. If you like this information, give it a like, subscribe to the channel, and comment with the next topic you'd like me to talk about next time. See you in the next one.